Hello everybody, uh, my name is Will Schultz. I am an engineer at MongoDB, which is, if you don't know, is a database company based in New York City. Um, and I'm going to talk today about how we use TLA Plus and TLC uh, to expose, reproduce, uh, expose, and, and verify solutions to a series of bugs in our replication protocol. And uh, this is joint work uh, between myself and a colleague on the replication team, Siwon Zhu, who is uh, not here today, but works at MongoDB. So to start, I'll just give a brief, very brief uh, outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'll start with giving a, bi a bit of background on what MongoDB is generally and how the replication protocol works at a high level. Then I'm going to go through uh, a series of bugs that we found over the uh, course of around two or three years, and I'm going to give some detail um, uh, on those bugs. Then I'm going to talk about how we specified our protocol in, in TLA+. Plus and how we model check the specification, and finally, uh, takeaways from our experiences using TLA Plus and the model checker. And if there's sort of one takeaway to keep in mind as the essence of the talk as we go through, uh, it's this, which is that w without some kind of formal model, it's almost impossible to design a non-trivial distributed protocol correctly. And TLA Plus and TLC are the tools that uh, make it possible for, for practicing software engineers to do this, as you've probably heard many times by now. So I'll start with some background. Uh, so ba just basic background on MongoDB, it's a document-oriented database. Uh, so in contrast to a standard SQL database where you'd store things in tabular rows, uh, it's a, a database consists of a set of collections. It's just a set of unique documents. Example here. And so, some background on how we develop MongoDB. So we have a, a fairly extensive and, and mature testing infrastructure. Um, we'll run thousands of hours of testing uh, on the new commits that come in every day on the, on the master branch. And, and this includes a variety of test um, types of tests. So we have a, a, a suite of unit integration tests. Uh, we also have many different types of randomized fuzzer suites. Uh, concurrency tests, and uh, we also run the Jepson uh, uh, fault injection framework for distributed systems, uh, among, among others. Uh, so for example, on, on a commit, we might, we run, uh, you know, we've run uh, 800, over 800 hours of testing, obviously parallelized, uh, just one uh, commit. So replication in MongoDB. So you can run a MongoDB database as a replica set which this is just a set of MongoDB nodes that coordinate together to provide high availability uh, using a consensus protocol. And the protocol we use is similar to the Raft algorithm, which is a, a consensus uh, replicated log protocol that was published around uh, maybe five years ago. And so we, it's a leader-based system, and there's a primary node uh, that will insert writes into the op log, which is just a sequential log of database operations. They describe uh, transformations to the state of the database. And secondary nodes will fetch log entries from other nodes and apply them. Uh, they may fetch no, uh, log entries directly from a primary, or they may also fetch entries from another secondary. And then each node obviously applies these log entries in a consistent order to end up at the same state. So again, as I said, the protocol is leader-based and something, a, a concept to keep in mind as we go through is this notion of a term. So replica set leaders are ordered by term. And a ter the term is just basically a counter. Uh, it's maintained locally on each node. And there are certain rules about how to update that. But one of the important things is that there can only ever be one replica set leader per term. So to, to lay a bit of foundation for the rest of the talk, um, I'm going to give a brief overview of sort of an example behavior of the system just give you a sense of some of the essential concepts uh, within the replication system. So we start in this example with three nodes. We have a primary and two second and SB. And we see the state of their logs represented here. And we're, they're starting out uh, just, uh, they're empty. And so a client write might come into the primary. And this node, as you can see, it has P underscore uh, with a subscript one, which means it's primary in term one. And it will include the term of, it, of the current primary in the log entry that it writes down. OK, then as another possible action, the secondary A may choose the primary as its sync source. So this means that it's the sync source concept is saying, who am I going to fetch log entries from? 
Similarly, this other secondary may choose the first secondary as its sync source. And then a possible action is for the primary to send a log entry to the secondary. And we can see that the secondary is now inserted in its log. OK, and now the primary takes this action called advanced commit point, which this commit point notion is just saying, what is the highest point in the log that is considered durable or committed? Uh, so up to this point, we know that no log entries will be deleted or rolled back uh, in the log. And so that's what that red line indicates here. OK, so now we see that the secondary replicates a log entry to the other secondary. OK, now the primary propag it propagates information about what the current commit point is to the first. So the primary advanced the commit point, and now it's telling the secondary about it. OK, so now as an example, the primary gets isolated or is disconnected from the other two nodes. OK, but it may still be primary for some time. It may not uh, step down or give up its, its leadership. So it may continue to actually write down an entry in its log. And you can see, indicated by the 1, it's still in this old term. But then maybe there's a new primary that gets elected in a higher term, term 2. And then it writes, starts writing log entries down in its own log. And can replicate them to the other secondary. So now we enter a situation where, if you look at log slot 2, uh, there, there's a conflict between primary, the primary in the term 1 and the secondary. In fact, the, both of these nodes. And so we have to enter this process called rollback, which is to say we need to delete a divergent entry from the log uh, so that we eventually will end up with, with consistent logs on each node. So to reiterate just some concepts to keep in mind as we go forward, and, and don't worry if you're not clear on all the details, but uh, these concepts that are important to, to sort of have a rough notion of is the sync source, which is uh, a no where a node is currently fetching log entries from, the commit point, which is sort of the high uh, watermark, the durable point in the log, rollback, which is when a node has to undo a, lo a, a divergent log entry, term, as I talked about before, and also this notion of a branch of log history, which I may refer to throughout the talk, which conceptually uh, you can sort of think as, as um, part of some linear history, but at times, uh, for example, in the case of rollback, and then have to come back in alignment with that log. Uh, Roughly, if you're on the same branch of history, you can say that one log is a prefix of another log uh, when you look at logs identified by the terms in their entries. OK, so now I'm going to go through a series of bugs uh, that appeared in the replication protocol and how we tried to fix them along the way. So these were a series of safety bugs uh, in the protocol. Sure. This entirely. Okay, that's working. Yeah, uh, and it, it really all stems from s sort of this genesis bug uh, that I, I call it in, that was found in 2016. So these are five bugs that I'm going to talk about in some detail, um, and. I'll start with this first bug that, that came up in 2016. So this has to do with heartbeat commit point propagation. So this was a correctness bug found in 2016 by a replication team engineer. And it allowed for nodes to erroneously mark log entries as committed. And so as I talked about before, uh, when, you commit, when you move the commit point to a certain point, you're claiming that a log entry is durable. And so the consequence of this is that a client could, for example, read data that it thinks is durable, even if it actually is not. And here's a quick example of how this bug would manifest. So we have two nodes, A and C, with the same log. Uh, and their commit points have advanced to the highest entry in their log. But node B, as we can see, is on a divergent branch of history. So in slot 2, for example, it has an entry in an older term. So it's actually going to have to eventually roll back that log entry. But by the rules of this uh, heartbeat commit point propagation, we would say we, we had a the protocol worked in a way that you could propagate commit point information between any two nodes. And so it would be perfectly valid for C 
to propagate the information about commit po its commit point to node B, and this would lead this would lead to node B uh, incorrectly committing log entries, uh, as we can see that the, the the log entry in slot two would actually be eventually rolled back. So our, our solution to this was to add a constraint about how commit points can flow between nodes in the system to guarantee that commit points are only sent between nodes on the same branch of log history. So basically, you can only retrieve a commit point from somebody. Your log is a prefix of theirs. And so conceptually, you can think about the what we call the sync source spanning tree, where um, a link in, in uh, if a node S syncs from node T, you can think about that as a link in a graph, and there should be sort of this tree structure where log entries flow from a primary down through to secondaries. Okay, so we fixed that bug, and it turns out that in 2018, uh, a new bug, uh, a liveness bug, was discovered. And it was turned up, it turned up in our test infrastructure. And the problem here is that you, we could get into cases where nodes are indefinitely unable to advance their commit point. So we have a, a rule about who you're allowed to pick as a sync source. And one of those rules is that you're only, at this time, the protocol said you're only allowed to pick someone if their log is strictly ahead of your own log. And in this case, if everyone has the same log, right? Uh, but we can see that node A and, no and node B have advanced the commit point up to entry two, but node C has not done that yet. So maybe C had crashed and come back online or something, and it needs to find a sync source, but its commit point is lagged. So it can't pick a sync source because it it's, uh, has the same log as everyone else, and so it can't update its commit point. And so you could end up in the state, if no new, things, new, new writes come into the system, where C is indefinitely lagged and its commit point never advances. Is this a, is a liveness bug? So as a solution, we said we could relax the sync source selection rules. Whereas before, we would say only pick someone if their log is strictly greater than your own. We said, OK, we'll slightly relax it to say that if your logs are the same, then in a special case, you can pick somebody as a sync source if their commit point is greater than your own with the notion that eventually that commit point would information would flow down to you. So that was the change that we implemented there. But fast forward to 2019, we discover a new bug in the system, another liveness bug. And in this case, we found that nodes may end up in sync source cycles, which would prevent them from ever uh, getting new log entries. And it happens to, it, it so happens that it's a, this is a consequence, this was a consequence of the previous alteration to sync source selection rules. So if you look at this simple example, there's just two nodes. And so node A is ahead of node B. And so it would be a valid sync source for B. And so B says, okay, I can sync from A and log entries can flow from A to B. And B replicates one entry. But again, because of the new alteration we made to the sync source selection rule, um, A might say, OK, I can sync from B now because its commit point is actually greater than my own, even though we have the same logs. So when it does that, we've now created a cycle that A and B are locked in, and they'll never make progress. And so we tried to implement a solution to this. And this solution relied on and I, the, the key idea that you sh it should be safe to learn of a commit point as long as it's on your branch of history. And so this could really happen via heartbeats or sync sources. Uh, but we just have to be careful to make sure that the commit point we actually learn is on the right, uh, not on a divergent branch. OK, so then a new bug is discovered in, in, later in 2019. Um, a, li a, a liveness bug of yet another variety. And th in this case, stale nodes might not be able to advance their commit point in certain cases. So be because of the previous uh, constraint we, we made on when you're allowed to learn commit points, 
We said that you're only allowed to uh, learn of a commit point if the term of the commit point is actually the same as the term of the last entry in your log. And again, if all these details aren't totally um, clicking for you, it's OK. Um, but so we could end up in a case where if a node is lagged uh, far behind by quite a bit, it simply, even if it would be safe to do so, it would not be able to advance its commit point uh, for some time until it properly caught up. And this can be a problem uh, from an implementation standpoint for certain storage engines uh, that essentially you have to keep history uh, snapshots in memory uh, if we're not advancing the commit point in a timely uh, manner. So another solution about, again, altering the rules slightly for commit points from your sync source uh, because you have a stronger guarantee about them being on the same branch of history as your own. So after those four bugs uh, are thought to be resolved, uh, we turned out, it, tur it turned out that we discovered yet another solution, uh, another problem. And this goes back to the first bug I talked about. So in 2019, we actually thought, we actually discovered that the original solution to the first bug was not always safe. So we thought that the, the, the fix was correct, but even though we had, we had discovered some liveness issues with it, but it turns out that in large replica sets with more than four nodes, uh, it, we, it, the, the protocol could again erroneously commit log entries, which is actually the same problem that we were trying to fix initially. But this only manifested in large replica sets. And I'll talk about this bug in a little bit more detail in the in next sections. All right, so with that, hopefully the overview of those bugs and the timeline there gives you a motivation for why we wanted to start using TLA plus and why we felt we needed to. Uh, to, to verify our designs and our protocol. So, so I'll give an overview of the key aspects of, of the spec that we wrote. So these are the variables in the spec. Um, we have this thing called the global current term, which is just the term of the current leader. The state, which is just a per server variable uh, that represents the current state of that node. Commit point, again, is the local commit point on each server log is just the node's log, and sync source is a node's current sync source, uh, if it has one. And the initial state predicate, not particularly interesting, just initializing mo most variables to a uh, appropriately empty, empty value. And the next state relation, so I'll talk about, uh, give a brief description of what e each action represents. So append op log action represents the replication of a single log entry from one node to the other. Rollback op log action is when a node deletes an entry in its log. Uh, be become primary by magic represents the, uh, the, the election of a node. And so, uh, right, so, so what the magic part is there is that we, we actually don't, in this spec, we don't model the full details of the election protocol. Uh, it's quite coarse grained. And so the election is uh, essentially a single step in the protocol. Uh, and that's why it's by magic. Um, client write action is when a new write comes into the system. Choose new sync source action. A node picks a new node, other node as its sync source. And then advanced commit point is when a primary chooses to advance its local view of the commit point. And learn commit point action is when one node propagates its view of the commit point to another node. So some stats on our, our spec. The original spec was only 295 lines of TLA plus with comments and some model checking helpers. Uh, then we had a slightly extended spec as well that models sync source selection, uh, which was 378 lines. Uh, so fairly small specs. All right, so now I'll talk about our experiences with model checking some of these bugs. So I talked about five bugs. I'm really only going to talk about model checking from basically the first three and sort of the last one. So I'll start with this one. So I'll, I'll show the action that we use for propagating commit points via heartbeat. And again, when I say heartbeat, this means just that the information can flow from any node to any other node, and there's no restrictions. And so this is a very simple action. It's just taking the state of one node, basically, and giving it to another node. And the only restriction is saying that if only propagated if it's newer than what I already have. And of course, then we specify what invariant, invariant we want to check. And we have this invariant never rollback committed, 
which just says, if you have a committed log entry, uh, make sure that it's never possible that you're going to roll that log entry back. OK, so here's some statistics from this model checking run. Uh, so this is this heartbeat commit point propagation, an early version of the protocol, with, with three nodes in the replica set, which we specify as a symmetry set. Again, as I said, propagating commit points via heartbeats. State constraints, we limit the term to be less than or equal to three, and we also limit the lengths of logs to be less than or equal to three. Using that invariant, we specified, and this is running on th this MacBook, actually, so uh, nothing fancy. And TLC fi finds an invariant violation uh, in a couple seconds. And there were only 9,000, around 9,000 distinct states in the full state space. And it's just a link to the raw TLC config. So uh, as we talked about a, a little, uh, previously, we can try to fix this protocol with a slightly altered action definition for commit point propagation. And so we have this learn commit point from sync source rule, which is the same as the previous action with one alteration. It's the first line there, which has enabled and oplog. And uh, I guess for those not familiar with that syntax, enabled, uh, if you say enabled of a certain action, it's, that means that expression is true if that action is enabled in the current step, if it could be taken. And in this case, that this sort of translates to saying, uh, if you can append your, if you can get a log int from someone, it means that you're a prefix of them. And so if that action is enabled, you're a prefix of them. And that is the condition we said for sync source uh, commit point propagation. So that's the precondition for this action to occur. So we can model check this with that new action. Basically, same state constraints, same invariant, same hardware. And TLC finishes in a few seconds with no errors found. So OK, so great. And there are 7,000 state states around in that state space, and that's about 1,500 or so less than the previous model. OK, so now at this point, we say TLC has told us it's, it appears to be safe. Um, but we only checked it with three nodes, right? So we can try <laughs> to run it with five nodes and see what happens. So we're now using the same model that we just used, except we're going to uh, use five, uh, model five nodes instead of three. Again, everything is the same. Uh, this time I, I ran this on a, a, a Linux workstation that's slightly more powerful, so this was running with TLC workers. And the invariant violation, an invariant violation is found in a couple seconds. And this state space is quite large, uh, considerably larger than the other, but still not mapped by any means. And it took about a minute to generate that entire state space. And so this, again, this was a particular bug that was never found in production or testing. So this was actually only discovered as we started to model other things, and this sort of appeared um, as we tried to check invariant, the invariance when verifying other solutions. And so I'll give a quick run through um, to give a sense, just to give you a sense of the sort of subtlety of this, this kind of bug, because I think this is interesting. So this requires f five nodes. And we're starting in a state where we have these three nodes left have all written down a log entry with term two, right? Uh, but then we have this node SD over here that has a log entry in term one. And so, for example, it may have been a primary in an old term, and it, it may have written down a log entry but never had the chance to replicate it to anybody. Uh, and so it's sort of a, this stale node hanging around. So it's possible that advances its commit point and propagates the information to node SC. We propagate information via sync sources and sync source, uh, for somebody to pick somebody up, their log should be a pre See how Thank you. Yeah. I can put it in this pocket. Thank, Th thank you. Um, OK. Right, so, so SC is trivially a prefix of any other log. right? So it could easily pick P2 as a sync source, and, it, and so it can get a, a commit point uh, from, from that node. 
But because it's trivially prefixed, it could also sync a log entry from S D, and it could do that in, in the next step. And then we end up in the same case that was problematic before, where we've erroneously marked a log entry uh, that, that's committed, even though it may be rolled back. OK, so now I'll talk about uh, how we model trick this, the second bug that I talked about in the last section. And this is a liveness bug. So the, if you recall, the problem with, that, that came up was that nodes would uh, could get into a state where they could no longer advance their commit points, right? which is problematic. It's, it's a liveness issue. And so we define a property of commit points that we want to hold true, which says basically eventually everybody ends up uh, at the newest commit point. And we decided to do that by saying if two commit points are ever uh, not equal, then eventually uh, they will be equal. And uh, again, maybe for those not familiar with the syntax, this little tilde arrow operator saying I, I, the, the, this is a leads to operator which saying um, if at some point in the behavior something becomes true, then eventually later on uh, this second condition will become true. And we, we had to modify this slightly. Um, this is sort of a detail that's not particularly uh, of great significance, but uh, there were certain cases where a node could sort of get into this rollback cycle where it would sync a log entry, roll it back, sync a log entry, roll it back, and could do this indefinitely without making progress. It's not a, really a case that we were worried about in a practical scenario, so we explicitly disallowed it um, by adding a, a condition to the temporal property. And so we were able to demonstrate that this, the original liveness bug with TLC using three nodes the, with that property on basic hardware took about a minute to find the temporal property violation. Um, that was after generating around, just around 20,000 distinct states. All right, so there's one more bug I'll talk about our model checking, how we model checked, um, which is a liveness bug. So I talked about previously these case of sync source cycles. And this is a liveness bug because you could, two, uh, a set of nodes could uh, end up in a case where they're never able to advance their logs and receive new log entries. So first we're going to add an action to model sync source selection and then specify the correctness property. Turns out that for this specific case, we actually were able to specify the liveness property just as an invariant because we knew what we were, we, we knew what we were looking for. And so it just is a little simpler to specify it as an invariant as opposed to a liveness property. So we add the new sync source selection action, which just says um, a node i can pick a node j as its sync source. And the requirement is that node i's log is a prefix of node j's log. And this other condition that eventually got us into trouble, which is that if the logs are equal, then allow the selection of a sync source if its commit point is newer than your own. So for specifying the invariant, specifying a two-node cycle is somewhat trivial. We just say that uh, node S has, a, has T as its sync source and T has S as its sync source. And so that's easy to specify. But we can also try to specify the general case of a potentially multi-node cycle. And the basic idea is just to model, as I, I showed before that diagram, to model the sync source spanning tree or graph in TLA plus. So if we can just consider the nodes of the system uh, as vertices in the graph, and then each edge in the graph is a sync source link, right, between S and T, where S is a, a syncing from T. And then we can just look for cycles in this graph. And so this uh, expression, it basically defines the set of sync source paths of some bounded length, um, but where a path through this graph is just saying like every edge in the path, uh, again, S to T is if S has T as its current sync source. And then we can define what it means for there to be a path from node I to node J. Um, I, in fact, a non-trivial path, right? So just of, of length greater than one. And then we specify a cycle as just being a path from a node back to that same node. And then finally, we can just specifically ask for cycles of size greater than two because we already had specified what it means for a, a spe we had specified the two node cycle case. And so we can look for a non-trivial sync source cycle. 
And again, TLC with four nodes, we use the same state constraints running with that invariant on my MacBook. We've, uh, it showed us the invariant in, in uh, five or six seconds. And this had, uh, again, around 200,000 or so states in the state space. And again, this was a bug that we had, we had actually seen the two-node cycle case appear in some of our testing infrastructure maybe once or twice. Uh, but we had never seen the multi-node cycle appear. And so this was a, a good way to verify that was also possible and was a case that we would have to worry about. All right, so now I'm just going to talk about uh, step back and, and talk about the takeaways from our experiences at, at a high level. <coughs> so first, uh, as I think many people have alluded to, uh, previous speakers, it's hard to know if a protocol is really correct without some kind of formal model. Uh, it's just very difficult for humans to reason about the edge cases of these non-trivial protocols, especially concurrent and distributed algorithms. The other thing which I think is... Uh, very valuable and interesting uh, is that even very simple and abstract models can help catch non-trivial bugs. Uh, so many of these models never used, never allowed more than three entries in the logs or, or the term to be more than three. Uh, in fact, I think there are cert many cases where the traces actually don't even require that many log entries. They may only require one or two log entries at, at maximum. Um, so I think that's a very interesting takeaway. Also, we, we did not, in this, in this spec discussed in this uh, talk, we did not explicitly model asynchronous message passing. Um, it's possible that there are other varieties of bugs that would appear if we had modeled that fully. Uh, but it was quite interesting to see how far we got in exposing issues by reducing the system to a very abstract model where things happen in these kind of big synchronous steps. And we, so we expect that formally modeling the system up front would have saved us many hours of engineering time. So again, to, uh, part of the, what I wanted to illustrate here is that it was sort of this long saga of a multi-year effort, um, a multi-year effort to root out all these bugs. We had to go through many iterations of design, trying to fix things. And each time, we, it was a realization that it was subtly incorrect in some way, whether for safety or liveness uh, reasons. And to, to do this, these efforts, it really only took a few weeks to model and check uh, these properties using TLA and, and the model checker. And finally, the, yeah, the future goal is to integrate it, TLA plus more formally into some of the design processes uh, so that engineers can use it as a tool available to them during design uh, to, for all different reasons, to codify their, their ideas precisely and to check things and to ask questions about their design to make sure it's correct up front. Okay, and so all the specs and models that, uh, that are referenced here can be found in this, this GitHub repo. Um, it, sh it should be actually easy to download them and reproduce um, the results from the command line uh, to run these models. So, yeah, with that, thank you, and uh, I guess you can open up to any questions. First of all, great talk, thank you. Thanks. Second, I actually have two questions. One's broad and open-ended, one is very short and technical. Which would you rather have? You pick. <laughs> um, so actually, I guess I'll go with the open-ended one. So you mentioned that you were putting in magic, essentially magic actions into your spec to sort of model at a very high level what was going on. And I'm wondering, did you at any point start using or trying to use um, refi module refinement? And if so, what were your experiences with that? Um, so the answer is no. We have not used refinement in any way. I know of it as a thing and that I've, you know, vaguely thought it might be useful, but have not pursued it seriously. Um, so this was, I did this work with, um, and then you can ask your second question too, but um, a colleague of mine, and it's funny that we sort of wrote specs, both sort of had written specs uh, of, of our own, and I would say that he actually taught me a lot, I think, about it was imp impressive to me how abstract his model was and yet how effective it was. Whereas one I had orig originally written myself was actually a lot, particularly lower level. Um, and so uh, it's, it was interesting to me see, to see how effective this approach was. Okay, so second question. Um, so you just wait for the microphone so it's in the recording. 
So at one of the slides, you mentioned that you added to one of the actions an enabled guard condition, right? Yeah. So one of the weird, sorry, one of the pitfalls I've run into with um, enabled is that it doesn't have to be reachable. It just has to be a valid action. So even if if you have an action that is always that is always true, but is not reachable by um, but is not reachable by the next state relation, it still counts as enabled. Um, is this an issue you ran into? Is there like was that a problem at all? Um, I'm not sure if I understand. I guess are you saying that something? An enabled predicate could be like trivially true in certain cases, or it's it's probably easier if I just like show you an example, like during the break. Yeah, maybe offline we can. I'm happy happy to discuss details. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what took your team to get a buy-in to spend that like several weeks when you didn't know whether this was going to be successful? Um. I guess the answer is we didn't really get buy-in in the sense that. Uh, this was a lot of those work was sort of done initially um, on our own time. Uh, I, I'm not going to say that's necessarily the way it should be done, but I do think, and my colleague I think would agree that we felt that before it has be, had been proven in any way, uh, it, sometimes the most effective way to convince people is just to show them results rather than asking uh, them for permission to go get the results. And so that I would say at least was our philosophy somewhat initially. Um, and now that we've had good results, I think it's a lot easier to uh, get formal approval and, 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 and backing and things. So, yeah. So, is it is the TL, uh, TLA Plus team at MongoDB growing now? Um, I think it's, it's, there's an attempt, yes, to, to start that effort. Um, we presented this work internally and, and have been more trying to get people at higher levels of management and things uh, integrating this into the processes in a more formal way. So, um, Do you also use your specifications to communi communicate with management, like the complexity of a certain project, for example? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say we've done that, any of that yet. More questions? Don't be shy. Well, okay. Uh, if you have questions, you can catch Will and the other speakers in the coffee break now, and we will reconvene at 4, 4 p.m.